everybody, Josh Barley once again here in Mission Control Houston. I'm joined by a very special guest today. This is Phil Ingeloff, a uh, former flight director here at the uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. With all the celebration this week of John Glenn's uh, 50th anniversary of orbiting the Earth, uh, you know, he also flew a, a certain space shuttle mission, STS-95, and Phil was actually the lead flight director uh, for that mission. So, Phil, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, it's been a number of years since that flight, but what do you remember about it and Senator Glenn? You know, it was really kind of interesting to be associated with that mission because I kind of grew up, you know, right. in that era yeah. when uh, uh, John Glenn's flight sort of steered a lot of us kids into our interest in the space program. And for me personally, it was really a big deal to to have the honor of being a flight director on a mission with this national icon of human space flight. At the same time, there was this huge contrast because it was a really very intense mission from a science standpoint. Yeah. And, and it was really challenging to get everything scheduled so we had this this uh, sort of sweet and sour contrast of all of this media attention and hype about this national hero flying against this backdrop of a lot of really hard work to get done in yeah. a short period of time. Yeah, there was certain things that actually had to be done during the flight, even with everything going on. That's you know, right. it was uh, it was a, it was an intense mission. That was back in 1998, right? That's right. So talk about some of the training. You know, whenever you were assigned as the lead flight director for the mission, was Senator Glenn already assigned to it, or did that happen afterward? Like, wh what was the timing of it? Yes, uh, it, it was kind of a conjunction of activities for me. I had been heavily involved in the Shuttle Mir program, and we had just really completed uh, that Shuttle Mir program, and there were some personnel changes going on inside the flight director office, and I sort of inherited the flight in midstream. Wow. I became available, and somebody else moved up in the management chain, so I uh, I sort of inherited it, and John Glenn had yeah. was just becoming attached to that flight, and uh, as you alluded to, the flight sort of already had an identity with some of the payloads with the Spartan Act activities, and the addition uh, of John Glenn to the crew um, sort of changed the complexion of the flight, and I had to sort of step in as the new flight director assigned and try to uh, meld all these pieces together into a coherent mission, and it was, uh, it was, it was quite an experience. We did a behind-the-scenes episode a couple of years ago during one of the, the shuttle missions, and we talked to the training team, and, and one of them was on the team that trained Senator Glenn and the rest of the 95 crew. And they were laughing. It was a true story, but they were talking about how Senator Glenn commented about, you know, the checklist that he had back during his flight. His original flight was probably a page, page and a half long, and now here we have these, you know, volumes of three-ring binders and how um, how things had changed. So talk a little bit about how the training was a little bit different for the crew and, and some of his comments about that. It really was very intensive, and, and it's sort of... Um I'd say divided into two different groups. Uh, I actually spent the bulk of my time working with the core shuttle crew with Commander Kurt Brown and the pilot Steve Lindsay on the traditional operation of the vehicle and, and the training that we normally do. And then there was sort of this uh, separate group of activities of the payload folks working on the payload experiments. And of course we had John and Shiaki Mukai and Pedro Duque and they had mm -hmm. this whole suite of science experiments to go on back in the space hat. And so those two things almost uh, went on in parallel, but at the same time, the timing and scheduling had to be integrated. So uh, it was quite a challenge to get all of the training activities scheduled. Um, but then also the reality was that got complicated a little bit by the media attention because every time the crew would go over to Building 9 for some training event, there'd be an army of media folks over there to videotape that. And uh, it was, um, I don't want to say it was a distraction, but it added a level of challenge to to hey, we keep like everything that kind of stuff, so. moving. Well, you know, <laughs> it's part of what we do here is to try to keep the public informed and and to convey what we do to yeah. uh, to the stakeholders. So it, I don't want to downplay the importance of doing that, but it did increase the level of difficulty. Well, it's, you know, we see that with the high profile flights, especially you know the last the last few that we had. Ironically, Steve Lindsay flew that very same shuttle again on its final on its final mission. So. Uh, you know, Discovery was a pretty important shuttle for him. But talk about, you know, Senator Glenn, you know, there's a lot of reflection back on his flight, you know, the fact that it's been 50 years. You know, whenever you look back at the STS-95 mission, what's the, what's the one memory you walk away from? Is it is it the attention of the flight? Is it working with Senator Glenn? The attention of the flight was a big thing, obviously, and people remember that as the John Glenn flight, and they don't really, you know, they kind of remember there was some science that went on there, but yeah. that gets lost. But for me, the thing that I took away, as I said, I sort of started out with my interest in the program um, when John flew in Mercury, and as you alluded to with the checklist, here we were 35 years later 
flying uh, ten day missions with seven people on a reusable spacecraft, yeah. doing just uh, an eye watering suite of science, and to me that was very symbolic of the progress that we had managed to make in human spaceflight since John Glenn flew the first time. And I saw that in some way, you know, John Glenn's first and his second flight is sort of putting bookends on an era of advancement. That, that That's sort of the way I remember the flight. So it's, it's funny you mentioned, you know, how things have changed and how they've transitioned. Talk a little bit about what you're doing now with the commercial crew program because you're very active uh, with that program, which obviously NASA's working very hard on. So what, what uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, that's right. Um, you know, we've come now to an era in spaceflight where the technology and the capability to do orbital spaceflight is within the grasp of commercial industry. And in fairness, uh, I, I think it's been pointed out many times before that even the shuttle was built by industry. It may have right. been sponsored and overseen by NASA, but it's, uh, it's the engineering and talent out there in industry that makes this all happen happen. Um, as NASA turns our attention uh, to exploration further away from Earth, um, you can see this transition happening of handing more and more duties over to industry. And those are the kinds of things that are really going to enable the long-term uh, deeper expo exploration of space. Traditionally, as in the early days of the American Space Program, uh, the government uh, used taxpayer funding to stand up capabilities that didn't exist. They were doing it for the first time. And a major program like Apollo took huge taxpayer resources. Yeah. But today, we have many industries that can support spaceflight. We have telecommunication industries that can provide uh, communications services on a commercial basis for not only NASA, but other operators of right. space systems. Um, launch services exist for reasons other than launching government astronauts and payloads. So you've built built up this sort of infrastructure that can sustain a base, and then NASA can advance by leveraging off of those capabilities and using the taxpayer investment to move beyond that point. And my personal opinion is that's the way I see us getting to the moon or to Mars, is there will be infrastructure in place that can be utilized and lower the investment cost to the taxpayer to do the inherently government parts of, of exploration of space. So I think uh, the shift towards commercial activity is really an important enabler for future exploration. Well, it's amazing the way things have changed in 50 years. It doesn't seem like uh, it's that long, but uh, things have radically changed over the last few uh, few decades. Again, when you look back at uh, John Glenn's um, Mercury capsule lifting off on an atlas on a pretty Spartan pad at, uh, at, at the time, Cape Canaveral, uh, yeah. it was... Uh, it, it's quite a bit different today to look at the infrastructure and the facilities and capabilities that we have. Well, we appreciate you coming by, Phil. I've enjoyed it. Thanks.